Yo, everybody, this is Jordan Grummet, a.k.a. Doc G, and you are listening to the Earn and Invest podcast. This is Rewind Week, and I'm going to play for you one of my favorite episodes with some of my favorite people about how fire has evolved. Sit back, take a listen. I think you're going to really enjoy this. And also, don't forget, this is the middle of July And my book, Taking Stock, A Hospice Doctor's Advice on Financial Independence, Building Wealth, and Living a Regret-Free Life, is on pre-order now and will be available through Ulysses Press August 2nd, but you can go to Amazon, Books A Million, Target, wherever you buy books, and pre-order it today. The easiest way to figure that out is go to earnandinvest.com slash pre-order. Again, earnandinvest.com slash pre-order. Check out the book and take a listen to this Rewind episode. I hope you enjoy it. No one knows when the financial independence retire early or fire movement actually started. Some say it was the publication of Vicki Robbins' book, Your Money or Your Life, in 1992. Others point to Jacob Lund Fisker's blog, Early Retirement Extreme, in 2010, or the advent of Mr. Money Mustache in 2011. Either way, Mainstream media discovered the movement in 2018, and the community and philosophy have grown quite a bit in just the last three years. Or have they? Today on Earn and Invest, we ask a simple question. Has the FIRE movement evolved? Our panelists, for the most part, discovered financial independence in the early 2000s and have collectively reached millions of listeners and readers. J.L. Collins is widely known as the godfather of the financial independence movement and wrote the ever-popular and best-selling book, The Simple Path to Wealth. He blogs at J.L. Collins NH, where his stock series has been credited as one of the best resources for new investors. Brad Barrett is a recovering certified public accountant, as well as the calm and cool voice of arguably the most listened-to fire podcast out there, Choose FI. And Jillian Johnsrud paid off all her debt, traveled to 27 countries, lived abroad for four years, and took five mini-retirements, all while bringing up six kids. She is a progress coach and the host and creator of the Everyday Courage podcast. I'm Jillian Johnsrud. This is Brad Barrett. Hi, this is J.L. Collins. And this is the Earn and Invest podcast. When I first heard of the financial independence, retire early, or fire movement, I changed just about everything. I started to budget assiduously. I tried to convince my wife to sell our second car. And then every day I would drive by the dealership so that I could plug in my electric car to save money on my utilities. And by the way, while I was there, instead of going to Starbucks, I would drink the horrible dealership coffee. Fast forward five years, and I'm as sold as ever on the idea of fire, but many things have changed. I no longer keep track of a budget or charge my car at the dealership. We never got rid of that second vehicle, and I even pay full price for coffee from time to time. My view of fire and my habits have evolved. Have yours? And just as importantly, has the fire community changed over the years? Jillian Johns Rood became financially independent at the age of 32. She is the creator and the host of the always excellent podcast, Everyday Courage. Jillian, welcome to the show. And I have, I have a burning question for you. Is your dog's name really Cheesy Taco? Yes, it is, which is the most important question. So I'm glad you led with that one. He really wants to be internet famous, um, but I'm lazy. So thank you for for introducing him as well. You heard it here. The beginning of internet fame started on the Earn and Invest podcast (laughs) for Cheesy Taco. (laughs) Brad Barrett is a recovering accountant who left corporate America to host Choose FI, one of the top personal finance podcasts on the charts. Brad, happy Monday. Happy Monday to you, Doc. Thanks for having me back. It's great to have you. Do you have a pet with as interesting a name as Cheesy Taco? I wish. You know, interestingly enough, I have no pets. I have never had a pet in my entire life, which is maybe says a little bit too much about me. But yeah, pet free here. Yeah, I was in my family. I think my wife and my kids are deathly afraid of dogs. So we are pretty much a no pet family (laughs) also. And last, but of course, not least, J.L. Collins is the author of The Simple Path to Wealth and writer behind the ever popular blog, jlcollinsnh.com. His stock series posts have been viewed by millions and millions of readers. J.L., great to have you back on the show. 
Great to be back. Thank you for the invitation. It is Monday, and today we are going to talk about fire. I'm going to be unfair to all of you right now, just for a moment. I want you to give me a simple yes, no answer. And of course, there is not a simple yes, no answer to this question, but I want to run through each one of you and ask simply, has the fire movement evolved? Jillian, yes or no, without detail, just to begin the show. Yes. Brad, fire movement, has it evolved? Yes, definitely. JL, I'll say it a little bit differently. Is the fire movement changed from when you first got involved? Yes, but fundamentally it's the same. We're going to talk in the second half of this show much more about the fire movement in general, but I want to start with your own personal journeys. Jail, when you first heard of the FIRE movement, first started thinking about financial independence, where were you in your own financial trajectory? Well, so I didn't, I didn't hear of the term financial independence, FI, or FIRE until a couple of years into writing my blog. Uh, and I started the blog in, in 2011. So for me, my blog came first. And of course, my blog is about my ideas around investing. And it was only after I started it that I began to realize that there was a bigger universe out there. And even then, I don't think the term FIRE had been coined yet. And I don't think even FI had been coined as a term yet. I think those were still to come. And I want to say 2013, 14 is, if memory serves me, when I first started hearing those. So definitionally, JL, you were financially independent before some of those ideas really came out and became big in our community and on the internet. Yeah, I was, I mean, long before I, I reached financial independence in 1989. But what's interesting about that is I didn't realize that at the time. And I didn't even realize that when I started my blog, I knew that I had enough money that I didn't have to work, but I didn't realize there was a, there was a term for it. So I, you know, I had been financially independent long before I realized that financial independence was a thing. Brad, was it the same for you? I mean, you were an accountant at a big five accounting firm. When did you start realizing what financial independence was and where were you in your career at that point? Yeah, so similar to JL, I was certainly following this path, unbeknownst to me that there was a community <laughs> that, that, you know, anything of, of this existed. It, it basically, yeah. so I, I'm, I'm trying to think of how I found it originally. So I guess I was introduced to JD Roth at Get Rich Slowly, which led me to Mr. Money Mustache and JL Collins and H. And those were really, the two aha moments for me were reading Mr. Money Mustache's shockingly simple math post and then reading JL's stock series. So those were the two lightning bolt moments for me of clarity, but also understanding that, wow, all this saving, all this natural, you know, I'm naturally frugal, but there's a point here. There's a point that I can retire early or whatever it may be, reach financial independence, which is kind of the evolution that I see this now. And it was cool to put to put that into reality, I guess. And yeah, JL, huge thanks yeah, to you. It was also kind of a realization, I think, for you as it was for me, that there were other people out there that thought this way. I mean, I, you know, I didn't encounter those kinds of people in my normal day-to-day -day life. And so it was a bit of a shock, a pleasant one, but a bit of a shock to realize that that there were a fair number of people out there who had these same kinds of ideas. It sounds like that was your experience. Yeah, it was. And I think, and we'll certainly talk about this later, but I think that's where I've seen the biggest evolution is this has become much more normalized now. I have yeah. conversations. Now, granted, I'm a podcaster in the FI world, <laughs> right? So, you know, it's a little selection bias clearly, but, but I hear people talking about this all the time. I, I had somebody from Verizon come into my house to do some work recently. And it winds up, he's a, he's in the subreddit for financial independence. He's like, I, <laughs> he gave me the exact minute that he's going to reach five, seven years, four months, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It was astonishing. And like, there are now hundreds of thousands or millions of people in this community. And 
we used to think of ourselves as islands unto ourselves, right? We were the, the frugal weirdos, but we're not that weird. We never were. And we certainly aren't, I don't think in the, in the common thought anymore. Jillian, as I listen to this conversation, I start to think that unlike Brad and JL, you, in a sense, were a little bit more like this Verizon person who came into his house that you were still kind of on the trajectory when fire became big, right? So maybe for you, this movement happened before you were financially independent. A little bit, but not really. So when we started, me and my husband, we, we started with this idea that we will save half. And I didn't believe that we could retire early. To me, early was like 60. That was kind of our first goal, if we could be five by 60. But we would take many retirements. So we were kind of on this, we'll save half, we'll live this more flexible lifestyle. And then it was about, we left our jobs 2014. And it was about two years before that, that I started seeing some things online. Yeah. And, but I had left a year before. So uh, for about a year I'd read, I'd seen like J money site. I remember finding early retirement extreme. And because I had also lived in a camper, I was like camper guy. Yes, <laughs> I can do campers, but yeah, I had, I'd had about a year of exposure to kind of this idea, but that was the first time a year before I left my job was the first time I had even heard of the 4% rule. So I had been kind of like they were talking about, I had been very alone, very much an island in this pursuit, really until I started blogging. And then I was like, oh, wow, there's actually a huge community here. But before that, I was just off doing my own little thing, saving half, trying to take time off work. Jail, you, like I, started really seeing the financial independence content, started really learning and hearing about it as it was going forward and realizing that you were financially independent already. Now, as I mentioned in my introduction, there was some pseudo extreme behavior that I started to take on, even though I was already financially independent. Did you have the same experience? Did kind of becoming part of this movement spur you on to do things that probably weren't necessary at the time? You know, I, I don't think so. And it might have been because of the stage of life I was in when, when I came across the whole movement. But, you know, like Jillian, I never had the concept of retiring early, particularly. That was never a goal for me. In fact, I at Money Mustache's request, I did a guest post around that very concept. I just wanted to not have to work all the time and to take periodic sabbaticals. And so when I got out of college, and it took me a couple of years to get my first professional job, but at that point, I just started saving half my money. And it was that simple. And then as my income grew, the amount that I was investing grew, but also the amount I was living on grew. So I never particularly saw it as deprivation. I, I just organized my life as if I was only making half the amount of money that I was making. I think when I first came across the FIRE movement and Early Retirement Extreme, as with Jillian, was the first blog other than my own that I saw. Oh, that's really intriguing. I never lived my life anywhere near the way he did, but I thought it was fascinating that someone could construct their life in such a creative and efficient way and uh, achieve this goal much more rapidly and with greater intention than I ever did. You know, it's interesting that you both mentioned the the fifty percent because that's kind of how we how we internalize it as well. So my wife and I, I guess we moved from a high cost of living area from Long Island, New York, down to Richmond, Virginia, which is dramatically lower cost of cost of living, certainly. And that was in our mid twenties. We we knew we were going to have kids at some point, or we wanted kids. So we always the plan was how can Laura stay at home. And that was, let's design a life that at worst, we can survive and thrive on 50%, right? On just my income. So that was always the, the concept. And like Jim was saying, you know, the, the word deprivation, I think that, that never crossed our minds. Like we never, we never went that far across the line of 
wow, we're eating the brown bananas and we're, you know, <laughs> scrimping and saving <laughs> the famous brown bananas, right? You know, it was, for me, it's always been, how can we live the same middle class or even maybe upper middle class lifestyle as everybody else and still save 50, 60, 70% of our income? And it, it, it's actually become this kind of like fun game that Laura and I, it, it's brought us closer in, in a lot of senses because, you know, we're making choices based on value. We're not making choices just to keep up with the neighbors or to worry about what are other people going to think like that. That has never crossed my mind ever, ever, ever. It's just about how can we live this amazing life and still save a boatload of money? And it's, it really is fun. It genuinely is. One of the most critical parts of what you just said, Brad, is that you were making choices. And I think a lot of people go through their life and they don't actually consciously make choices, especially around what they're doing with their money. And that, that, sim- that simple process of, of making conscious choices about what you're doing is incredibly powerful. Yeah, agreed. And I think that, unfortunately, we don't, because we don't learn about personal finance, we don't learn about any of this stuff. People, have, what do you, where do you learn it from? You learn it from your parents. You learn it from, hey, what are the neighbors doing? What is everybody Choose else doing? FI. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> well, that's the cool thing about what all of us are doing, right? We're changing, changing the narrative and we're making it, we're normalizing this behavior as opposed to this being, you know, like I said, 10 minutes ago, us being the frugal weirdos, right? Us feeling like yeah. there's something slightly off about how we're living. Like I always had this deep internal sense that, that we were doing it right. But when you are one out of 10,000 people, like even, even, you know, I, I'm pretty self-confident when I, when I want to be, but like even the most self-confident person starts to waver every now and again, when it's, you know, one out of 10,000, right? So it's, it's been pretty amazing. And I think that's, you know, doc, that's one of the big changes just in the five movement generally is there's a community now, right? And obviously this past year has been tough with, with COVID and, and not having the, the in-person get togethers, the camp fives, the FinCons, all these things, Chautauqua obviously is, is, you know, the, the crown jewel, Jim, but, but having a community of people and seeing people in your real life that are, that are doing this and getting together for board game nights and potluck dinners, like it just makes it so much more tangible when, when you see people and you can rely on people, you know, you can ask for, five-minded concepts in your own hometown. So anyway, that's one of the big things that I've, I've think has, uh, has been such a positive. Jillian Brad brings up community. And I guess a big question is, has the community changed? I feel like when financial independence retire early was really in its early heyday, there was a lot of talk of specifically earn as much money as you can and retire as fast as you can. Do you feel like the message is different now? Hope so. I hope it's, it's shifted because for a lot of people that that message is problematic in that I have a big gripe with the 4% rule and my largest issue is that people use that as their permission slip of, can I make a change? Can I do something different with my life? Can I switch jobs? Can I switch careers? Can I move? And if the, if the four, if their money hits the 4% rule, it says yes. And if their money doesn't hit the 4% rule, it says no. And they just won't, they won't, they won't leave a job they hate and this is something on the back end, you know, I, I coach people through this transition that's so incredibly frustrating because I'm like, you'll have a million dollars. You'll have two million dollars. Like you can leave a job you don't like. <laughs> um, <laughs> and they're like, oh, but what if it's the 3.5% rule? Then I don't have enough money. Maybe I should just stick it out for the next three years and be <laughs> miserable. And I'm like, How did we get to this point that people have half a million dollars, $3 million, their money's still telling them, no, no, you can't make a change. No, you can't take a nice vacation. You know, I can absolutely relate to what Jillian's saying. And when we used to do Chautauquas before COVID and I'd have one-on-one sessions with people, it would be amazing how 
uh, I'd hear people say I'm in this soul crushing job, but the amount of money I have, I'd have to pull 5% instead of 4%. And I just can't do that. And my advice would always be if I'm in a soul crushing job and I have enough money for 5%, I, or even six, I'm going to pull the trigger and, and, you know, if things turn, turn against me, I'll, I'll figure that out, but I'm not going to stay in that soul crushing job if I'm not struggling to pay the rent uh, week to week or month or month to month. You know, I think the unfortunate thing with the 4% rule is that word rule. And that word rule has caused endless debate about it. If you just change that word to guideline, and I think the 4% rule is a bad rule. It's a wonderful guideline. And when I hear people talking about, well, maybe it shouldn't be the 4% rule. It should be the 3.86% rule. Or, <laughs> I'm, I'm reminded of something about 400 years ago, theologians, and this is serious, by the way, theologians used to debate about how many angels could dance on the head of a pin. These were serious debates. Seems ludicrous to us now. And these 4%, these conversations around the 4% rule strike me as those, those conversations about how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. It's a good guideline. It's a great guideline, but you need to take it with a grain of salt. And the other thing is, I've had people, people say to me, you know, I have enough. I've got, you know, I, 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 I could only draw 3%, but I like my job. I don't want to have to quit. <laughs> no, you don't have to quit. <laughs> you know, it doesn't say that you have to quit when you have enough money. It just, just means you can do whatever you want to do. And if that means you want to keep working, then keep working. Yeah. And to me, that's the most problematic aspect of, of fire is, is people's just reliance on that, the retire early. Like it doesn't, I mean, oh, that yeah. why we call it a choose of I, it's just, it's always FI. We very, very rarely say fire because it's, it's a distraction. Really, I never use the term fire. Yeah. I'm always it's FI. Yeah. yeah. It's FI. Right. And just like JL and Jillian are saying about the, the 4% rule or, you know, really the guideline or rule of thumb, like people just, they, they spend so much time agonizing over the little details when the important thing to Jillian's point is, is the, the power that you're accruing in your life by yes. saving money, right? Like it doesn't matter if you have, you know, X number of months of savings or you're halfway to five or you're at five, like it's, you are so much more you're in such a better position than you are clearly, obviously, when you're living paycheck to paycheck, right? Like that first time you have a couple thousand dollars, are you at five? No, you're very, very far from it. But are you in a better position than you were a couple months ago or a year ago? Dramatically so, right? Like, and that to me is the beauty of Phi, that this is a path that really any of us, no matter where we are, we can get on this path because it's just about being in a better position tomorrow and every day thereafter than you are today. That to me is the aspirational goal. It's just living a better life. And by having a little bit of space financially, that gives you the space then to say, oh, I don't need to stress about this every second of the day because it is a huge stressor, right? Money clearly is a huge stressor. And then you can take a step back and say, hey, what do I want out of life? right? Like who are the people that I want to spend time with? How can I get healthier, right? Like all of these things that are these higher level concerns that we just we push off, we push off endlessly. And when you get that little bit of space, all of a sudden the world opens up to you. So it's this gateway to a better life, I think. Amen. Let's take a quick break. We are discussing whether the fire movement has evolved with JL Collins, Brad Barrett, and Jillian Johnsrud. I'm Doc G, and this is Earn and Invest. We talk here on Earn and Invest a lot about our finances and making those decisions now that'll help you in the future. And one of those decisions is how you should deal with real estate. My friend Chad Carson, also known as The Coach, is the host of the Real Estate and Financial Independence podcast, they help you learn there how to use real estate, this very important asset class, 
to build your financial independence plan. There are two types of episodes, one where Chad tells you the tips and tricks and lays it all out for you, the other where he has guests, proof of concept, examples of how people are out there today using real estate to meet their dreams. Check them out at CoachCarson.com. Again, that's CoachCarson.com. It is the Real Estate and Financial Independence Podcast. Take a listen. You won't be sorry. Let me reintroduce our panel. JL Collins is the best-selling author of The Simple Path to Wealth. Brad Barrett is the co-creator and host of the Choose FI podcast. And Jillian Johnsrud is a progress coach at JillianJohnsrud.com. The other challenge with FIRE in this early retirement is people tend to view it in this very black and white. Like, Doc, you were saying, I'm going to work really, really hard and save lots of money, and then I'm going to retire and I'm going to earn no money and I'm never going to work again. <laughs> because those are the two things that we've seen lived out. People either work full time or they retire when they're old and they don't work at all ever again. But I'm especially this year, this spring, coming out of the pandemic, a lot of people and a strong stock market year. So we're coming out of a fatiguing year and we're coming out of a strong stock market year. I'm seeing more and more people going, I'm just tired and I'm burned out. And I haven't been commuting. And the thought of going back to that commute once my office like resumes, yeah, I'm not fire, but I have a hundred thousand. I have five hundred thousand. I have one point five million. Like, do I have permission to do something else? And I have a lot of I'm having a lot of conversations with clients and behind the scenes of people saying, I think I just need a year, maybe just two years. Like, is it is it okay if I skim? a hundred thousand or 200,000 off of the top of this and just, and just take a break. I mean, I like my work. I'm just so burned out right now. And I think a lot of people coming out of the pandemic had a different sense of like, man, family's really important. And I really miss uh, my parents and I really miss my extended family and my friends. And so if the fire movement's changing, I hope it's changing in that the 4% rule doesn't just tell people no. But all of this financial freedom that they've accrued helps them sign those permission slips for themselves. Yeah. yeah. I think what both Brad and Jillian just said is it's a journey as well as a destination. You know, we think of FI being that moment you're financially independent, meaning that you have enough money that uh, your money is working for you and can pay all of your bills. And that's a wonderful milestone, but it's an absolute journey. And As Jillian said earlier, and in her comment just now, her experience was to take some of that money and take breaks periodically, not to wait until you hit that magic FI number. And that's what I did throughout my career. And again, maybe it was an advantage not to have the concept of an FI number. I just wanted to accumulate what I referred to as FU money, which meant just enough money to give me breathing space so I could make bolder choices. But I never had the intention that it was enough money that I'd never have to work again because I just didn't have that concept. So every, as Brad said a moment ago, every every dollar you set aside makes you that much stronger. You know, it's like going to the gym. Every Every time you go to the gym and you lift a weight, you're not instantly Arnold Schwarzenegger, but you're stronger than you were the day before by a very small, sometimes undetectable amount but by amount and amount, nevertheless, that over time accumulates. And you are immediately better off for having taken that step. Brad, has the avatar changed? I mean, if you go back to 2017, 2018, when I really got into this movement, I thought of a lot of people who were pursuing financial independence tended to be high income, mostly white males who did in fact hate their jobs. So they loved this 4% rule because they could hit 4% and then quit and plan on not making money again. Do you think that's what the financial independence community looks like today? I I really don't. I I agree with you though, that it did at some point. And I, I I think in fairness, a lot of that was because of who were the biggest voices, right? You think about the early popular bloggers and and clearly, Pete, Mr. Money Mustache comes to mind. Brandon, the mad scientist, Carl from 1500 Days. Like, you know, these were all guys in their 20s and 30s who were in tech fields, right? So it, that avatar, that's what it looked like. 
at first. And I think, I think what a lot of us have, have been trying to do over the years is, is to normalize this, right. To make it so that this is something that everybody can aspire to and this, and realize that this is not just for them, whoever that them is, right? Like it's so easy to say, oh, I could never do that. This is for them. Well, I know on our podcast, for instance, and we're, you know, we're just one of hundreds or thousands of, of places that are, that are getting these stories out, but we've tried to highlight every possible story that, that comes across our plate because people relate to stories, right? So you see yourself in that one person and, you know, it makes, it emboldens you to realize, wow, I can do this. And I think, I think to me now, this is at least, you know, in our Facebook group, we have 70 odd thousand people. I think at last check, it was over 50% women. And I know we have a massive number of families. So to imagine that this is for single white males in their thirties who are in tech jobs, like that is just, that truly is 2015, you know, in 2021, this is a big broad tent that really everybody can find a place in. You know, my, my take is, is a little different and I don't think it was like that in 2015. Now, my frame of reference is a little different. We, we ran the first Chautauqua in 2013 and I, I didn't have any concept of diversity when we were putting this Chautauqua together. I was just hoping that 25 people, which is how we limited the number of people, would actually sign up and, and come, and, and they did. But one of the most surprising things to me, it was a very pleasant surprise, was how incredibly diverse that group of 25 was, right? From the beginning, it was racially diverse. It was diverse in terms of sexual orientation. It was diverse in terms of age. It was diverse in terms of wealth. It was completely diverse in terms of occupations and income. So again, that's two years into my starting my own blog. And that was really the first time that I actually got to meet people from the community, or at least from my community. And it was, it was a wonderful benefit that I had no expectation for. I hadn't even thought about. And that has been true of every Chautauqua since then. And if you go back and you read my follow-up report of that 2013 Chautauqua, that's one of the things I talk about is the incredible diversity. And I did that a little bit strategically, by the way, because I wanted to encourage that. I wanted people to, from all different walks of life to know that this was a place where they would be welcome. But I didn't have any expectations. I, and by the way, I also didn't expect only white male engineers to show up. Uh, I'm a white male, but I'm an English major, so I wouldn't have fit in with that group. So I, my experience is this has always been a diverse uh, group of people that are bound simply by this idea of of having their money work for them and not always having to be the one working for money. Yeah, and that's a great point. I, I think... I think what I was trying to get across, and I, I guess I did it inartfully, so I apologize, but was <laughs> was that that was the caricature, not that that oh, was reality absolutely. necessarily. So, absolutely. But no, it's still the caricature. Yeah, unfortunately, to a, yeah. to a degree. I don't think quite as much as it used to be, but yeah, I, I, think, I, I think we still do get pegged with that a little bit too much. But yeah, that's uh, really interesting to hear about the early Chautauquas. Yeah, from the beginning. And as you know, because you and, and Jillian, for that matter, are both in speakers of Chautauqua, and you've experienced that firsthand and the kind of diverse group. And I don't even remember which Chautauquas you guys were at, but they've all been the same along those lines. Well, that was no, your groups were no different. I mean, different people, but in terms of, of the range of people, they were no different than any other year. Jillian, as we see that maybe the financial independence community is much more diverse than we thought, we're also seeing a diversity of ideas. I remember you were one of the first people who I saw who said, look, let's talk about mini retirements. And to me, that was really interesting because it was someone who veered off of the path of let's just get to 25 times as fast as possible and then go from there. We're now seeing the slow fi movement and people talking about coast fi do you think that we've moved kind of away from that overall goal and much more to lifestyle? 
I hope so. And honestly, what I think helped shape that journey is enough of those early writers getting the thing they wanted, which was to be 100% fi, and then to go, shoot, maybe I should have built a better lifestyle before I got here. Maybe I should have you know, tried to retire earlier. Maybe I should have done things differently. And I think if we wouldn't have had that, that group of voices that said, actually, this was a hard transition. And that's what I have people think about is the life that you want, this phi life that you're imagining, how close are, to, how close are you to it now? Because if it's a mile away, a hundred miles away, that's going to be a hard transition to get there. And the reality that even in the fire movement, most people don't hate doing stuff. We tend to attract a group of people that likes to do stuff. We're just tired and we're burned out and we don't feel engaged with our work. And for those people, man, I mean, even a month off can rejuvenate you, but a year off, two years, I mean, Sometimes it's hard to imagine how long of a period of time that is. I did a six-week and a 10-week road trip with my children in a pop-up camper. And 10 weeks is a long time. <laughs> um, it is not a short amount of time. When we finished 10 weeks, I was like, yeah, and now we're done. I'm so glad to be home. <laughs> um, so realizing that like, you can use these shorter breaks to get you closer to those things that you want. And the other thing I would try to encourage people is that like some of these seasons are really short, especially when you have kids and there is an expiration date on them and they will not hold for 10 years. I took all five of my kids in a pop-up camper to 10 national parks that has an expiration date. I couldn't be like, oh, guys, I just need to work really hard for 10 more years, and then we'll go when you're 22. (laughs) Nope. (laughs) They will not want to go. (laughs) And so I think there's some realization that, man, this this 4% rule, this 3.5% rule, that's eight years out. And where where am I going to be in eight years? Where are my kids going to be in eight years? Where are my parents going to be in eight years? Like... Well, I have those same opportunities that I'm that I'm pushing for right now to have. Well, they have expired. Brad, is it more okay than ever to slow down? I remember again at the beginning of this journey, this idea of slowing your path to financial independence was almost anathema. And I don't feel like today's group of financial independence community members feel so strongly about that. Yeah, I would agree. I would certainly agree with that. And and yeah, what Jillian said that it did used to seem like people were rushing. It was just about that goal. And as Jim said, this is a journey. It's not about, it's not about that goal. If you just put your head down and race towards Phi, you might be there on paper, right? You might see those numbers on your computer screen when you log in. But if you haven't done the work on yourself, right? The inner work and and what does what does life look like? What does happiness look like? What what do I want to do with my time? If you just wake up one day and say, "Oh, I'm at Phi, I quit," I can't even imagine the shock, the mental shock that like, what do you do next? Right? I mean, it truly is about slowing down, and like I said before, it's about finding that space along the way, and that starts from day one of your Phi journey. You get that little bit of space and it keeps it keeps on increasing, right? A little bit more power, a little bit more time to step back and say, what do I want my life to look like? Because, you know, there are so many of these horror stories, right? If the I know Brandon, the mad scientist, we've had on a couple of times to talk about this. He's, you know, he is a famous person in this community, but he's one of many, many thousands of similar stories of people who put their head down. They deprived themselves. They got to Phi and at some point along that way, they said, oh man, what, what is this all about? Right. It it can't just be about the money. It truly can't. Yeah. The other thing 
because I have these conversations so much behind the scenes. And if you start to pay attention, you'll, you'll hear them in Facebook groups and in comments is when people do this, they're going 70 miles an hour down, down the interstate. And then they throw that puppy into reverse and they try to do this really hard transition. (laughs) It creates so much dysregulation. It creates so much discomfort, especially that first month, two months that, that they're miserable and people will think, why the hell am I giving up all of that money to be miserable? I had a job. I was making money. I liked making money. I was saving money. I like saving money. <laughs> why am I doing this to be miserable? And that discomfort, you'll often see this three months, six months in, they'll say, what of two things? One, actually, I've been thinking about these numbers. I don't... You know, I thought I had enough, but honestly, if I could just save like another hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, I would be in such a better spot. Shoot, then I could have, I could get an extra ten thousand a year, and this cool job opportunity showed up, and I just feel like I would be a fool to turn this away. Like I don't, man. If I just stuck with it for like two or three more years, that's going to give me another ten thousand dollars a year with a four percent rule. Like I think I have to take it. And the reality is they just are experiencing a tremendous amount of discomfort and going back to what is familiar is easier than navigating that change because for all of us across the board, it's easier to suffer than to deal with with the fear of change. Suffering is familiar. We know it's hard, but we know it's not going to kill us. And the fear that comes with change is so intense, even though it's brief, even though it's fleeting and suffering can last a long time. Nine times out of 10, people will choose suffering than the fear of change. But the reality is you go back to work for three years, you're just kicking that ball further down the field because you're still going to have to figure this out. If you want to get to that great FI lifestyle that you imagined, like Brad said, you're going to have to do the work at some point. You're going to have to figure this out at some point. So either try to figure it out while you're in your job or take a little break and hunker down in the discomfort of change and try to make some progress. Jail, when I began personally this financial independence conversation, and I feel like when our community started having this in-depth conversation, you know, in 2015, 2016, 2017, There was a lot of talking about tactical issues, right? Because at that point, no one understood. So they didn't know what it meant to have enough money to retire. They didn't know what the 4% rule of thumb was. They didn't understand what, how we made these moves, how we invested, how we got there. Seems like today's conversation is a lot more about mindset. Do you think that's a fair statement? Yeah, I think it's certainly a fair statement about this conversation. And it's interesting to me because I think both Brad and Jillian are much better positioned to talk about that than I am. Because while I'm a member of this community, I only write about investment. I don't write about the lifestyle very much. I I think of Money Mustache as, as being somebody who's a lifestyle writer. I I didn't retire early. I didn't have the concept. I wasn't even aware of the concept. So it was never a goal for me, as we talked about earlier. And and Jillian and I have this in common. You know, our goal was to to have enough FU money to step away for those breaks and sabbaticals. I liked working. I liked my jobs. I just didn't want to have to do them all the time. So this has always been something, this, the lifestyle part of this conversation has always been something that I've, I've watched with interest, but it's, I've always felt it's a little bit out of my wheelhouse in terms of having anything to offer. Again, I'm, I'm more talking about money and investing, and, and that, of course, is one of the tools that you need to bring to bear or that are, is useful to bring to bear to then have a more creative thought process about your lifestyle choices. I started writing five years ago, uh, actually five years ago, right about this time. And because I had done a number of transitions, 
And because my husband had been in the military, so a lot of people technically retire early, and I had seen how badly those transitions go from they've put in their 20 years, they're 38. They go from a high structured, high stress job to nothingness. And it's a disaster almost every single time. And so I started writing a lot about this this thing. How do we create the lifestyle that helps that transition? How do we transition? And almost no one was interested because they weren't there yet. They thought, shoot, if I had enough money, I would leave tomorrow. If I had enough money, I'm out of here. Like that won't be any trouble for me because it was so far away. They couldn't start to experience that fear and that discomfort. Usually that fear and discomfort happens within about 12 to 18 months of the transition, which is why we have one more year syndrome. Because you're just close enough to start to feel that, oh gosh, stuff's going to change. I'm going to have to make a transition. I feel uncomfortable. Maybe I'll just stick around for one more year and push that discomfort out a little bit. But a lot of people weren't interested because I thought that won't be an issue for me. And part of the change I've seen in the last five years is that we've had five good years of the stock market. There's this big community that's helping everyone. People are making a lot of progress. You know, my clients now that have $2 million net worth or a million dollars net worth, five years ago, they felt like they were just kind of getting going really in the journey. And now it's starting to, I would say for a large percentage of the population, the FI population, that's shifting and they're getting closer and they're thinking, oh, they're starting to feel that crap. I should kind of (laughs) figure some of this other stuff out if like, am I actually going to am I actually going to leave in a year? Am I actually going to leave in two years? Like, oh, I wonder what what the other side of this is going to look like. So I think that has been part of the reason the conversation shifted is that because of the community, because of the stock market, a whole bunch of people are actually a lot closer to FI than they were when I started writing. Let's take another break. We're discussing whether the FIRE movement has evolved with J.L. Collins, Brad Barrett, and Jillian Johnsrud. I'm Doc G, and this is the Earn and Invest Podcast. Are you enjoying the conversations we have every Monday and Thursday on Earn and Invest? Well, if you are, there is another place where you can meet with community and have similar conversations. That is our Facebook group. You can go to earnandinvest.com slash Facebook. And join a community where we talk about personal finance, the economy, current events, you name it. If it's happening, we talk about it. Check us out at earnandinvest.com slash Facebook and become part of our community. Let's reintroduce our panel. Jail Collins is the best-selling author of The Simple Path to Wealth. Brad Barrett is the co-creator and host of the Choose FI podcast. And Jillian Johnsrud is a progress coach at jillianjohnsrud.com. The money is is the easy part. And I say that, you know, take it with a grain of salt because I'll explain further. But really, I spend and I'd love to hear how much time you guys spend thinking about your money. But I spend sub 30 minutes a month at this point. It's all on autopilot. Like for me, it's all right. Save 50 percent of your income and read JL's book. Right. Like if (laughs) that in and of itself is going to save you, set you up for a very successful financial life. So it's the, the money is easy. It's what does life look like? What is, what is a life well lived look like, right? Like that is the process that I don't know that you ever really answer it. Right. But again, going back to what we were saying before, if you just wake up on that Phi day, right, I scrimped and I saved and I did all this stuff to get to Phi, And then what now you are in for a rude awakening. I mean, I've been working on this for 10 years, just trying to figure out what do I want my life to look like? And, and I got to tell you guys that, you know, the, the, the big secret here is money doesn't make you happy, right? Like, I think we can all say that, like, we know plenty of wealthy people that are unhappy. And I know plenty of people in the FI community who, you know, you have a million, $2 million, but that by itself does not bring happiness. Not even, not even close. It is that inner work and it's a process, right? There are days where you can ask my wife, I could get her in here. Like, I'm the biggest jerk in the world, right? Like, and I've been working on this nonstop. It, it's not, 
and, and that doesn't negate all the work that I've done, right? It just means I'm human. And I think it's important to understand that. Like we are humans. We're not special because we're in the fight community. There's nothing like it's, this is not a panacea. It's just, again, it gives us that space. And I've said that three or four times now, but it gives us that space to step back and apply some scrutiny to your life that otherwise people just, they put their heads down and it's just, I'm just going along. I'm going with the flow, right? in the fight community, out of the fight community, whatever, that's how we live our lives. We don't, we don't think about it, but I think having that space and the ability to apply some scrutiny, I think it will help you live ultimately a better life. Truly. Yeah, I think that's, that's a great point. And I, I think one of the confusions around the role money plays, and I agree with you, Brad, it, money by itself doesn't make you happy. But the lack of money can make you unhappy. And I think a lot of people, when they're on this journey, one of the reasons they start this journey is that lack of money that is causing stress and unhappiness in their life. And it's easy to see why you would assume that, that uh, as, as your money situation improved and that stress started to get go away and you became happier, you would assume that money was the source of happiness. And at that level probably is a major contributor. But once you have enough, then uh, it, it plays a never diminishing role in, the, in, in your happiness. So, yeah. And Jillian, that's what I wanted to ask you about is you, you speak with so many of your clients and you, you do the work, right? Like there, you help them facilitate doing the work. What, what does lead to happiness, right? Like, is it, is it finding challenge? I know that's such a broad and, and nebulous question, but like, like, is it day to day? Is it like having specific goals and challenges that you're working on? Like, is it com- connection and community? Like, or, I mean, is it truly just case by case, individual by individual? I think the broader connecting theme is people knowing what they want out of their life out of their days, what they value, what's important to them, setting their own goalpost and then achieving that, I think is success. I had a situation once where I offhandedly to a coworker mentioned, yeah, my brother's really successful in his own way. And and I guess I'm as successful in my own way. And she looked at me and said, in what way are you successful? And I said, Everything that I've set out in life to do, I've accomplished. And I think that's living the life that you want to live, that's success. And for Jail and Brad have both been to a talk that I give. I gave one at Chautauqua, one at Camp Fi, about this idea of what is that Fi lifestyle, but also this challenge of the transition. If you haven't done any of the work to get you closer to that Fi lifestyle, on that day... (laughs) And you open the spreadsheet and it says 4% and people kind of naively think I'm going to change everything about my life that day. I'm going to have a better relationship with my spouse. I'm going to learn how to apologize. I'm going to make friends. I'm going to find hobbies. I'm going to take up running. It's nuts because any one of those things is so hard to do. And the idea that people's plan is I'm going to do all of them at once because I don't have any time or bandwidth or energy to do it before I hit five. We somehow internally, we know that this is going to be a disaster, which is why people keep pushing that transition further down the road. Because that idea of doing that work, that idea of change is, is more difficult than the idea of just suffering. And like JL said, that soul crushing job. Brad, I mean, Choose FI undoubtedly gets a huge amount of attention from people who are newly interested in financial independence. Do you think there's more understanding there about these lifestyle issues? Like, I feel like for our group of people who went through this, it took us a while to evolve to get there, right? Because we really started many of us just with the numbers. And we've now ended here realizing that the numbers only get us so far, the money only gets us so far. It's really the lifestyle we have to figure out. Do you think the newcomers to this movement are maybe a little more savvy than we were about this stuff? I do. And I think it's because a lot of us, to your point, have have realized this. 
And a lot of the content that we're putting out and we're highlighting is around these issues, right? Like if I think about a month, a given month of Chooseify, just as a, for instance, you know, we do eight roughly one hour episodes. There are some times where I look back over those eight hours and I say, did we even talk about finances at all? Like literally, like, are we, are we truly a financial independence show? And it always comes back to yes, because again, the nuts and bolts of the money, that's the easy part. It really is. So I know just on my own show, and that's the, you know, really what I can talk about. Like we probably spend 70 to 90 plus percent of our time talking about these issues because, because this is where the work needs to be done. It really, it really is. So yeah, I, I do see that on a, a broader, a broader basis. And like Jillian, for instance, we just talked about, we had a couple episodes on our show about relationships and money. I mean, that's so critical, right? Like, so there is an intersection here. And I think us highlighting that intersection in all aspects of life, I think is really important. I would say based on like coaching clients and experience, I would say people are very nuts and bolts focused till about 50 or $100,000. By the time you've managed to save your first $100,000, you've typically figured out all of the essentials. You figured out your budgeting, your tracking, your investing, your emergency fund. Like You've got all of those pieces figured out in that period. But after that, it it's really gets important to focus on this other stuff because yeah it's it's honestly just more challenging it's harder to measure it's harder to figure out if you're doing it right you know even for a lot of my clients like they want to transition they want to make a change but man the numbers are such an easy metric to look at and all of this other stuff is such a difficult m- metric to measure and to quantify that it's just it's easier to go with the thing that's familiar and and more measurable. But yeah, up to the I would say up to fifty, a hundred thousand dollars, the nuts and bolts are are really important. So I want to end this conversation by asking to me what is an interesting question about the financial independence movement. It clearly has evolved. Are there parts of it that are still destructive, JL? I mean, I know for me, one of the parts that I think is destructive about the community is this idea that perfect is the enemy of good. Sometimes I think we go down this rabbit hole of efficiency to such an extent that maybe we need to back off and just accept good enough. JL, are there things about the financial independence community you think that need to change? From the the basic, the investment perspective that is is where I work, where I do my work and what people come to me for. No, it hasn't changed at all. In fact, that's one of the ongoing battles, if you will, that I that I come across when the pandemic was first hitting a year ago. I was hearing from people and the market was crashing, although it didn't stay crashed very long, but at the time it was crashing and people were saying, aha, well this is different. You know, this time it's doing, of course, one of my themes is that it's never different, that market crashes are normal. The only thing that's different is what triggers them. And But I was here, no, no, the jail, this time it's different because this is a pandemic. This is not a financial thing. And my response then, in fact, I, I just put this up on Facebook again a year later, was no, it's not different. The trigger's different. You know, it's a pandemic. And it's a more tragic tr- trigger than than most because this is a trigger that's killing people. But it's every crash has a trigger. And every time that trigger is different than the time before, which makes them impossible to predict. So from the investment point of view, I would argue that no, it, it hasn't changed. And I don't foresee it changing. Those basic principles are timeless. And uh, to go to Brad's point, in many ways, that's the easiest part of it. It can be a struggle. And of course, I, you know, I'm talking to people all the time who are struggling with the financial part of it. So it doesn't feel quite as easy to me, maybe. But, but fundamentally, it is the easy part. The struggle is, is understanding that all the nonsense that Wall Street creates, you can really ignore and just focus on the nuts and bolts, the simple index funds. And once you get to that point, then as Brad said, you're not paying attention to your finances all the time. You don't have to, and most people don't want to. And frankly, 
And I say this in regard to my daughter, who also doesn't want to focus on her investments all the time. That's a superpower because the people who focus on their investments all the time are the ones who are much more likely to tinker with them, much more likely to, as Warren Buffett once said, try to dance in and out of the market, try to time the market. And that always results in worse performance. So when Brad doesn't pay attention other than lightly once a month to his investments, that's a superpower. When my daughter doesn't pay attention other other than to add to her index funds, that's a superpower. But I don't think that changes. Yeah, and to Jim's point, the when I said the the money part, that's the easy part. You know, obviously, I think we're talking about the nuts and bolts of that. Yeah, right? we agree on that. Yeah, no, unquestionably, yeah. right? And yeah. and as Jillian said, for people just starting out, for people in debt or you know getting to that first fifty or hundred thousand dollars, I mean, that's a remarkable achievement. And clearly, you are focusing yeah. on the money, right? So we're not trying to make light of that in any way. Or, or minimize that. So, you know, that's critical to point out. It's it's easy nuts and bolts wise. It's not easy behaviorally, right? To make those changes. But yeah, I mean, I guess for me, for me, the thing that we're focusing on or that people still sometimes focus on too much is it may be getting too close to that deprivation. And I think people sometimes pride themselves on you know, competing on what their savings rate is, right? There's, there's, so there's a competition, there's a keeping up with the Joneses just in a, you know, couched in positivity of, oh, my savings rate is 78.2%, <laughs> right? But, but it's still, it's still destructive. It's so, the same psychology. It's exactly, it's the yeah. exact same thing. So, you know, I find people sometimes apologizing for purchases and or prefacing it with, this is not very fi, but dot, dot, dot. <laughs> what the hell is five, right? Like, what does that mean? I mean, it, it should be something different for all of us, right? Like, and I think that's, that's the one way that I think my life has improved so much more actually is I become less frugal. I, I focus much more on value now. And I, I, I'd like to believe, or I'd like to maybe delude myself into believing that, that I was always this kind of valuist as I call myself now, but, but it, that's definitely been an evolution. And it's something I'm, I'm, it, you know, we're always working on ourselves, right? But like, I spend money on things now that I would, that Brad from 10 years ago would have been aghast at, truly aghast. And I am very, very content with where I am. And, and if my spending goes up, it goes up, you know, it, it is what it is, but it's still, it's still based on that value. And, you know, there are certain things that I, I don't suspect I'm ever going to drive around in a fancy brand new car. I think that's unlikely for me personally, but I don't begrudge people or say that that's not very fi, right? To, to say it jokingly, like if that's what you want to spend your money on, by all means, you know, that's, that's not my, my liking or my life. But if you've made that decision and you've, you've taken the time to scrutinize it, right? Like we talked about earlier, so many behaviors are just unconscious, but at least if you step back and really think about it, and then make the decision, then more power to you. This is your life. There's no competition for how fi can you be. The other, the other thing I would add to that is money is relative. And if you follow the investment path that we collectively lay out here, you're going to wind up having a lot of money. Your money is going to be making money. And so in terms of buying that new car, as, just as an example, you may well get to the point where buying that new car is the financial equivalent of buying the 2000 car, $2,000 car when you're first starting out. So things change. And, and you're a good example of that, Brad. You're, you're financially independent and you are going to year by year get financially stronger. You're going to have more and more resources. So it would make sense that you want to spend some of that money on things that you value. And that's, and again, it goes back to your making conscious choices in doing that. And so, yeah, I don't think anybody should have an objection to that, but I hear like you, I hear a lot of people like Chautauqua will, you know, will preface conversations with me about, well, I, you know, I, I spent this money and, and there's all, and I'm like, nah, it doesn't, it's your choice. It's your money. You can do whatever you want with it. And by the way, I would extend that to maybe financial independence isn't 
a goal that everybody values. And maybe saving and investing is not a goal everybody values. Personally, that's hard for me to understand. Personally, I think you should, but it's not my money. And so when I come across people who say, I don't want to do that, then, you know, there's no law that says you have to. Jillian, last word, anything about the movement as it stands today that seems particularly destructive to you? Oh, I would love for it to change how I talked about kind of suffering versus like the discomfort of change. I would love it if we would stop nobilizing, if that's a word, suffering. And that narrative sounds like, oh man, you have such a great job. Just if you could just stick it out for three more years, if you could just keep your head down, oh man, think about where you would be in 10 years. Like just keep suffering to try to get to this goalpost quicker. And if the narrative behind this, like idolizing the suffering would remove and this this grasp of the 4% rule, just saying yes or no, that the 4% rule has to sign your permission slip. And people could look at, you know, it's one of my most popular podcast episodes is how, how we tend to get stuck at a six in life. It's a very sticky place when it's just okay. The reality is sometimes in the five movement, people get stuck at like a three or a four. They're really, they don't love their career path. They don't love their current job. They don't love some things about their life, but they continue to suffer to get to five faster, hoping that once they hit that 4%, it'll sign the permission slip and they can make a change and finally really start enjoying their life. And I feel like that's that's really destructive. And I would love for that to change, that people could be like, sometimes I'll use the example of like, if a 22-year-old who really wanted to take a trip around the world had as much money as you had, what do you think they would do? <laughs> they would be like, oh my God, this is amazing. I'm going right now. Like, There's also this misconception that we'll feel differently about our money depending how much we'll have. The reality, all those emotions around your money, if you feel fear and scarcity and it's not enough when you have 100000 that doesn't automatically change when you have 500,000. It doesn't automatically change when you have a million. Oftentimes people have the same emotions around their money, despite what the numbers are. So that destructive thing would be just, man, if you have, if you have a hundred thousand dollars and you hate your job, you can find a new job. If you have half a million and you want to switch careers, if you think I cannot possibly see myself doing this in 20 years, you can switch careers. Uh, people do it with a dollar in the bank. You can surely do it with half a million. Well, JL, Brad, and Jillian, I wanted to thank you for having this conversation. You know, this whole time I've been talking about how we have evolved as financial independence practitioners and how the FIRE movement has evolved. But maybe I've been using the wrong terminology because in a lot of ways, It hasn't been evolving as much as it's been adding. I think we started with these basic principles of how to get our investments and our money and our financial lives in order. And the way we've changed over the last few years, we've added a bunch of information about lifestyle and thinking about what we really want out of life and living our best lives. This idea of using money as a lever or a tool as opposed to an endpoint. And I think if there's anything I can glean from our conversation, it is that. If people who've been listening here want to get in touch with you or learn more, I'll start with you, Jillian. How can they reach you? You can reach me any which way, but I would recommend if you want to learn more about kind of this lifestyle stuff, I have a free 10-day course that has different like 10 days of little lifestyle lessons with little videos. And it's a great just sampling to start having these conversations, Um, especially if you have a partner. It's a great tool to like discuss it with them. And don't, Um, of course, miss out on her wonderful podcast, Everyday Courage, which you have to Um, check out. uh, And you can find that at JillianJohnsRude.com. And Brad, if people want to get in touch with you or know more, how can they reach you? 
Yeah, I guess the easiest place is the Choose a Fi podcast. Or if you want to actually get in touch with me, probably the easiest place to go is to uh, sign up for my weekly email at chooseafi.com slash start. And if you really want to get in touch, just hit reply and that will come directly to my inbox. And JL, I am sure everyone knows how to reach you as well as Jillian or Brad, but please inform them just in case. How can they get in touch with you if they want to know more or where can they read more about you? Well, probably the place to start is the blog and that's jlcollinsnh.com. And from there, you can find me on Facebook and Twitter. And, uh, you know, if you look there, the JL Collins NH is the handle that's easiest to find me. This has been the Earn and Invest podcast. On behalf of myself, Doc G, I'd like to thank Jillian Johnsrud, Brad Barrett, and JL Collins. That's a wrap. 